Officer, you need help? Uh, stay back, sir. I got this. Uh, uh, hey! Uh, 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 wait uh, down! Uh, uh, help me! Uh, uh, As many players know in the gaming industry, horror can manifest itself in a variety of manners. Whether it be in the form of psychological horror with Silent Hill, jump scare horror such as Five Nights at Freddy's, or action horror like in Fear, there are many examples of horror games that would prove to be successful franchises within the gaming industry. However, one may have a convincing argument on their hands if they stated that none of these franchises would exist in the first place without the success of Resident Evil. Resident Evil would be successful not only for Capcom, but perhaps the entire horror genre as we know it, as it's difficult to imagine where the genre would be today without Capcom's magnum opus. Even Resident Evil didn't come out of the blue, however, as it took inspiration from a variety of other horror media itself. While this may be able to partially serve as an explanation for how Resident Evil came to fruition, Capcom certainly paved its own path for prosperity afterwards with numerous sequels most of which would become great successes in their own right. So what about Resident Evil made it worthy of all these successes? What exactly did it start out as? And where exactly does it intend on going now, 25 years after the first game's prolific release? To answer these questions and to celebrate the success of such a revolutionary game in the industry, this retrospective is a way to take a look back at an all-time gaming classic the game known outside of Japan as Resident Evil. The story for Capcom's first foray into survival horror begins not with Resident Evil, and not even with a game exactly. Instead, it starts with a movie by the name of Sweet Home. This Japanese horror film's premise includes a small film crew that visits an old, abandoned mansion belonging to a famous artist. After entering said mansion, varying paranormal events occur, from possessions to hauntings to, of course, killings throughout the movie. The similarities in premise to Resident Evil wouldn't be purely coincidental. While Capcom doesn't appear to be involved with the film's production, the company would go on to publish a survival horror game based on the movie and manage to get the same producer of the movie to also produce the game. Another prominent figure for the game's release would be Tokuro Fujiwara, who is known for directing Ghosts and Goblins, Commando, and Bionic Commando. The director of the Sweet Home movie would tell Fujiwara not to worry if the game doesn't follow the movie exactly. Fujiwara would also get to take a tour of the film's studio and, by his words, use whatever essence he thought would work in the game. Having the creative freedom to use what he thought would be necessary for the game, and carefully considering how he would bring elements from the silver screen to a game, Sweet Home would be made and released as a survival horror RPG for the Famicom in 1989. Although identifying which game is the first one of its genre, some consider Sweet Home to be the first true survival horror game. Of course, none of this would matter much if it were a failure. Its artwork depicts more gruesome images than other games of its time, its music would be adequate for a horror title, and its gameplay would greatly help add to the suspense of its horror atmosphere, due to added tension from always having one group more vulnerable than the other. While only being released in Japan, and therefore not commonly known about elsewhere, Sweet Home would be and is still considered to be a great horror game that would lay the groundwork for survival horror going forward. It would be looked upon as a terrifying game in its own right, and some even regard it to be scarier than the very film it's based on. Now that a good survival horror foundation is laid out, it would be time to start putting it together for a new game. This time, the whole world would get to enjoy it.
It would be a few years before the team would start developing a new game of a similar genre to Sweet Home. Around the PlayStation's release, conversation at Capcom would turn towards launching an original franchise. Fujiwara would be able to do things he wasn't able to include in Sweet Home, and he thought that horror could become a genre in itself for gaming. Game designer Koji Oda would join the early development team for a new project in 1994, simply codenamed Horror Game, and was being developed for the Super Nintendo. It would start out as a spiritual successor to Sweet Home. The project at this time likely looked very different from what it would become for two main reasons. One being the technical limitations of the Super Nintendo when compared to PlayStation, the other being that its setting was in an entirely different, hellish, and more abstract location. Development would soon be moved from the Super Nintendo to the PlayStation. At some point, programmer Yasuhiro Anpo would be hired and over the course of the decades be valued as a long-serving Capcom employee who even directed a couple of Resident Evil entries. Upon recollection, Anpo states he was told to play Sweet Home when first joining the team. He states that for their upcoming projects, the chief of consumer products had a strong desire to successfully create a brand new genre of horror gaming that hadn't existed before. Fujiwara hired another person to direct and create this upcoming project. Shinji Mikami, a now prominent figure in the gaming industry, would be called in to talk about making a horror game using systems from Sweet Home that would feature a mansion inspired by the Overlook Hotel from The Shining. Mikami was initially excited about this project as he highly respected Fujiwara and was a big fan of Sweet Home. This project would feature the supernatural, and Mikami would focus primarily on gameplay, mostly ignoring its story and script. This would result in Mikami being criticized by his boss regularly. Mikami's perspective was that a haunted house doesn't need a story, and it was already difficult enough to create a game where players feel serious fear from it. After approximately six months of working on the project alone, Mikami drew many basic pictures of what he'd imagined what the screen would look like with characters and had over 40 pages of the script. He would start to add employees to work on the game once it became clear what direction the game would go in. Sony would announce the technical specs for their upcoming PlayStation console, but the team was skeptical of its capabilities and decided to redesign the game with a first-person perspective instead to save on processing the player character. Mikami also wanted to use the first-person perspective to instill more fear into the player by them seeing the enemies more up close and personal. <laughs> The first prototype of this was made, but Mikami wasn't satisfied with it. The team considered using a Doom-like 3D environment, but reconsidered. Fujiwara and Mikami both used Alone in the Dark as a reference, since it was an example of how a horror game could be done. Mikami had played Alone in the Dark, and stated it had more expressiveness than what he saw from the first-person prototype of his game. He states, this was due to not being able to see the main character in their game, and therefore, the player loses their sense of identity with the character they're playing. He further describes that it was also more difficult to build the kind of fear they were going for. The kind that comes from having the camera suddenly jumping to a different point of view to heighten the suspense. Upon re-examination, Mikami admits that without Alone in the Dark, Resident Evil might have become a first-person game instead. There's only a single picture on the internet that's claimed to be the only known concept art for the first-person Resident Evil in its early stages. Due to the aforementioned drawbacks, Mikami adapted Resident Evil to a third-person perspective. This perspective would become the basis for main Resident Evil titles for over two decades. More than just a camera angle, however, another major change would occur during the development for Resident Evil.
Mikami would worry about how well a horror game would realistically sell, and thought that just making a normal game wouldn't cut it. He thought ghost stories and exorcist type games would be popular in Japan for the next couple of years, so he went with the idea of supernatural beings for early prototypes, and later stated that it was more psychological. After about a month, however, he realized that it didn't work well in his game. He decided that something more material was needed to have combat and opted for something else. Mikami decided that thinking freely without being tied down by traditional genres would be the way to go, and therefore attempted to create as frightening a game as possible. Instead of supernatural entities like ghosts, he thought about real monsters that you could see, ones that would come and attack like in Jaws or Alien. He drew a comparison. In a movie, the main character doesn't do exactly what you would do, but in a video game, you play as the main character. Mikami essentially wanted to make a horror movie where you could become the main character and experience the fear for yourself to see how you, the player, would decide what to do. The sense of fear he wanted to get across was the kind of fear you get from dangerous, living creatures rather than the supernatural. To him, that's far more frightening because it seems almost possible. So zombies would become the main enemies. As for influences for this decision, it's difficult to think of modern zombies without thinking of George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead as a possible influence for the decision to move to zombies for Resident Evil. However, Mikami states that his main inspiration for moving to zombies was actually from a negative reaction he had to the Italian horror movie Zombie. When he saw the movie, he was dissatisfied with the plot twists and action sequences, so he thought it would be cool to make a horror game, one that captures the same sense of terror where the player gets the feeling that he's the main character in a horror movie. Like many games in the PlayStation era, this game would start being developed as a fully 3D game. The team would originally attempt to have everything appear in full polygons, but even early on it became clear this wouldn't be possible given the hardware limitations of the time. If no changes were made, the project could end up on indefinite hold. That's when the team looked yet again at Alone in the Dark. While the character was being rendered in 3D in real time, the environments were pre-rendered. It seemed that approach would work for Resident Evil, although this too introduced problems. There were control issues initially, and the change in perspective that required static camera angles had an effect on immersion, making the player feel a bit more detached. It took Mikami a bit of time to get his feelings in order to make the call to change to pre-rendered environments. Most of the major changes would be made by this point, yet there would still be a plentiful amount of changes to come before the game's release. Way. Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> According to Anpo, the team didn't expect the title to be much of a success. It wouldn't receive special treatment, but instead the opposite, especially towards the beginning of development. Most of the time, fresh new faces in the company or staff who had extra time on their hands would be the ones asked to help with development. Despite facing an uphill battle, the more the game came to fruition, the more the game received acceptance from within the company. After playing a prototype during development, Mikami thought about how exhilarating it was to take down a zombie. He describes it as a feeling that you can't get from watching a movie. He sensed they might have a new genre on their hands. During development, it was clear to Mikami that this game would be more adventure-like and have puzzles where the player's decision-making ability was key. To truly maximize the horror atmosphere of this game, designer Koji Oda stated that Capcom was open to the idea of designing a game to work against the player, limiting how often the player could save or heal themselves, not displaying a precise health gauge and betraying the player's expectations. These are ways in which the team challenged the players for a better horror experience. 
They hoped the players who could accept those restraints would come along for the ride. Fujiwara didn't concern himself with how far the game would go. Instead, he often encouraged the team to make content even nastier. If something ended up going too far, they could always cut it later. Even so, Resident Evil had a large amount of violent and gory content for the time. Sony was often cooperative with Capcom, but the United States was a bit more strict due to pressure against violent content. Despite this, Mikami still thought that Americans especially would get into this game. In late 1994, Capcom would ramp up marketing for the game in the US. The headquarters in Japan let the US branch know that the name would be Biohazard. However, due to an American band as well as multiple games that used Biohazard in their respective titles, it would be difficult for Capcom to register the name Biohazard in the US. After combing through various other names, the marketing group decided on Resident Evil for its international release. a pun referencing the evil residing within the mansion of the game. At some point in development, Mikami thought about having a two-player cooperative mode, but the team would give up after a while due to technical limitations. Biohazard. In August 1995, Resident Evil would officially be presented at the V-Jump Festival. This version of the game shown would be reasonably representative of the final game, with some minor changes. These mainly include no cutscenes, some different camera angles, different enemy placements, minor aesthetic and music changes, and a different location for the snake boss, Yawn. Towards the end of the development process, the team grew massively to upwards of 80 people across the approximate three years of development. Debugging the game was performed by members of the development team since there was no such thing as a QA-specific company or department for Capcom at the time. The people who reviewed the intro cutscene for the game said it was scary, so the team made it black and white, only to realize that may have actually made it even scarier. Capcom would create a red triangle mark to indicate its mature content. The game would finally be ready to release to the public, yet the team at the time had no idea just how huge Resident Evil would become. Resident Evil would release in Japan and the US in March of 1996, and in PAL regions later that August. Fujiwara only expected Resident Evil to sell approximately 200,000 copies. It would be a bestseller in North America, the UK, sell over 2.75 million copies and quickly become the best-selling PlayStation game. By December 1997, the game would sell approximately 4 million units worldwide and gross more than $200 million. All PlayStation versions of the game would sell a combined 5.08 million units worldwide. Resident Evil would also often be listed as one of the greatest games of all time throughout the decades from a variety of publications. It would also get a Guinness World Record for Worst Game Dialogue Ever. Whoa! What is it? What? While this is likely no surprise if you've played much of the first Resident Evil game, the original team appeared not to realize this game's dialogue as poor in quality. According to Anpo, the director's influences came heavily from horror flicks and zombies, so the contents naturally veered towards an international perspective. However, since all the development staff was Japanese, the team ended up with poor localization that he heard hindered the realism and immersion of the title, a factor in Capcom deciding to remake the game later on. There were also Japanese performances recorded, but left unused as Mikami found the quality of said performances inadequate. When asked about what he's most proud of, Mikami states that he's proud of being able to capture the creature's realistic movements, as well as instilling a sense of terror through the audio and video. While Capcom did have a studio for motion capture, they didn't use it in Resident Evil. Coders instead studied books, videos, and films to learn the movements of spiders and people. 
One Capcom artist allegedly scanned in a picture of a dead person's eyes to capture to help get a sense of the point of death for the zombies' faces. When asked what Resident Evil's strong point was, Mikami states that it's first and foremost scary. Elaborating further, he says that if you're the guy actually holding the controller and moving around instead of watching, the scary music building up, gross monsters popping up, it all really locks you in. Especially when walking through a hall when suddenly some freaky monster jumps in front of you. With over 5 million copies sold and generally great reception amongst fans, it's likely fair to say that the team at Capcom achieved a profoundly new and, of course, scary horror experience for the time. Zombies as a genre isn't exactly new. Yet, like its namesake would suggest, it just keeps coming back. It seems to infect everything, from books to movies to TV shows, and of course, video games. Still, even zombies can get stale after a while, and that's exactly what happened for a period during the 80s and 90s. Maybe what's most surprising about this isn't that zombies can get stale, but instead that it can be brought back. And most credit would likely go to, you guessed it, Resident Evil. The concepts of zombies as we know it today would be attributed almost solely to George A. Romero's 1968 film, Night of the Living Dead. This, too, would essentially be a resurgence to the zombie formula, albeit greatly changed from what it was previously. Flesh-eating, grotesque creatures whose origins are often science-based rather than magic-focused. This would be the new standard for zombies from here onward. The movie industry would find immediate success with zombies for a while with movies like Dawn of the Dead, Zombie 2, Hell of the Living Dead, and Return of the Living Dead. There would be an overall decline in popularity for zombie movies from about 1985 to 1995, however. While zombies still existed within a few popular movies or games, they were typically done so as part of a group of undead or the supernatural, such as in Ghosts and Goblins or the Evil Dead trilogy. It wouldn't be until 1996 when zombies would re-enter the mainstream, though Alone in the Dark and Sweet Home both showed great potential in their varying elements. Resident Evil is what brought it all together by reviving zombies and having a clear focus on survival horror gameplay. English journalist Kim Newman states that the zombie revival began in the Far East with Resident Evil and Sega's House of the Dead, which inspired even more zombie films. <laughs> The zombie trend would more fully re-emerge during the 2000s. Both Shaun of the Dead's Simon Pegg and The Walking Dead's Greg Nicotero attributed the revival of the zombie genre to Resident Evil, with the latter also mentioning House of the Dead. 28 days later, writer Alex Garland also thinks Resident Evil was the game to revive zombies as he states that it helped him remember just how much he loves the zombie genre. Zombies just keep coming back. Even now, we await the presence of numerous sequels in new games using predominantly zombies as enemies. One could definitely make an argument that zombies are oversaturated in the gaming industry. Whether it's for better or worse, it's probably not too much of a stretch to blame Resident Evil for that. Alongside its huge popularity, Resident Evil would have many versions throughout the years. The original release of the US version of Resident Evil would be made more difficult than the Japanese version. In an era where rentals were more commonplace than today, this decision was made so that players would have more incentive to fully buy the game as opposed to renting and beating the game within a few days. This was done by disabling auto-aim, giving fewer ink ribbons, giving enemies more health, giving Jill and Chris less health, and including less ammo. All of these made it difficult for even the internal R&D team at Capcom to beat. Resident Evil would be ported to the PC in 1996 and, unlike other versions, featured fully uncensored FMV footage in color and included new weapons and unlockable outfits. After this version, Resident Evil would make its way to the Sega Saturn in July 1997 and added a new battle mode, two exclusive enemies not in the main game, 
graphical enhancements and has some other mostly minor changes. After a highly publicized delay of Resident Evil 2, an updated version of the original game that includes a demo for Resident Evil 2 would release for PlayStation in September 1997. This director's cut would include an arranged mode that changes the location of most vital items as well as enemy placements. This version of the game would also restore the auto-aim function for the US release in all modes. The very next year in August 1998, Resident Evil would arrive in the form of Director's Cut DualShock version that features support for the DualShock controller's vibration and analog controls. Notoriously, this version would also include a new symphonic soundtrack replacing the originals. While this soundtrack would include a few notably well-received songs, They were often overshadowed by a few notably criticized songs. Intended to be released in late 1999, a Game Boy Color port of Resident Evil would be in the works until Capcom cancelled the project due to the poor quality of the port. It would be leaked in 2012 by an anonymous individual for $2,000 to publicly release a playable ROM. The final port would be made on the Nintendo DS in 2006 under the title Resident Evil Deadly Silence. This would commemorate the 10th anniversary of the series and contain a classic mode which includes minimal enhancements and touchscreen support. Its rebirth mode contains more enemies and a series of new puzzles to make use of the platform's hardware. For the first time in this game's history, Deadly Silence also includes wireless LAN support for up to four players in two different game modes. One cooperative mode where each player must help each other to solve puzzles and escape the mansion together, the other being a competitive mode where players must attempt to get the highest score by destroying the most monsters. While many changes were made across all of these ports, there are still some things left out that were in previous prototypes or concept art for Resident Evil. Probably the most notable change in its development was with a character named Dewey. He's described as having a comical tone who walked with his hand stuck in his crotch. The team modeled him and even put him into the game, but after the first tests, they decided he didn't fit. Another character cut from the final game would be a large cyborg named Gelzer. Not much is known of Gelzer, just that he was apparently made redundant after bringing in someone to write the script, and was therefore dropped. More gruesome scenes would be censored in the international versions of the game. While the North American and European releases of the director's cut were marketed as featuring the original, uncensored footage from the Japanese releases, the cutscenes in question were actually still censored. Capcom claims this omission to be a localization mistake made by the developers. An early 1996 preview in Maximum Console magazine featured a graveyard and a slightly different version of the final boss. The graveyard didn't make it into the final game, but it did get put in the 2002 remake. When asked what kind of game he wants to make after the first Resident Evil, Mikami responded, I want to keep the same type of scary, horror feel and move from adventure to action, a full-on action game. While development needed to be restarted around 60% through its development, Mikami would ultimately produce the original game's incredibly lauded sequel, Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil would grow into Capcom's largest franchise to date. Capcom would release a total of five major installments in the Resident Evil franchise before drastically switching the gameplay and camera style oriented more towards a third-person, over-the-shoulder style of gameplay. They would then release three more main entries before yet again switching up the gameplay and camera. For Resident Evil 7, development would make a full circle to first-person survival gameplay with a much heavier focus on horror. Just like how the team initially described their plans for their first Resident Evil game so long ago, but couldn't pull it off due to technical limitations.
Reflecting on what stuck with him the most when developing the franchise, Mikami states that Resident Evil wasn't a game that should have been made into a series. His reasoning is that horror tends to have strong patterns that are easy to get used to, meaning they're easy to get tired of. He says that if Resident Evil hadn't sold so well, maybe he could have spent his 30s doing creative work as a studio director instead of working as a producer, though he still feels like a very lucky person to be able to have those kinds of worries. While Mikami's role in the older games was essential, he hasn't been involved with the franchise in recent years or with projects in the immediate future. As for recent years, Capcom has been remaking older titles in a more over-the-shoulder perspective, as well as continuing the main story in first person. To celebrate the 25th anniversary of the franchise, Capcom is releasing a brand new CGI series titled Resident Evil Infinite Darkness. An all-new game meant to celebrate the anniversary, Resident Evil Reverse is slated for release, albeit with abysmal reception thus far. As for the mainline entries, Resident Evil Village looks to continue the first-person horror in promising fashion similar to its immediate predecessor. When starting development, no one at Capcom could have imagined how far their upcoming horror epic would go. Not only did it do justice to zombie or horror genres, but it practically reinvigorated the former and paved a pathway for the latter. Starting out as a game that seemed to be more risky than it would be worth, Resident Evil would turn into one of the most important games of all time for both gaming and horror, and hopefully I've shown you some of the reasons why. Thanks for watching.